Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. In the late 1940s, following the development of uh, more or less guided missiles, such as the Fricks X glide bomb and the Kamikaze, the U.S. Navy started looking at a series of missile countermeasures, ways to shoot down these incoming missiles. The missiles were moving too fast to be able to accurately uh, track and engage them with the gun armament that ships were at the time armed with. So they were looking for a more high-tech solution. This was referred to as Project Bumblebee. Project Bumblebee essentially developed three missiles, a short range, a medium range, and a long range, called the Terrier, the Tartar, and the Talos. Tartar was the smallest, shortest range of the missiles, and that one uh, could essentially be fitted to, to ships of all sizes, including destroyers. But it was also the least capable. It was, it was a short-range missile because its size didn't allow for more than that. Terrier is the next largest and uh, probably the most cost-effective. It had a medium range, was uh, relatively robust, and able to shoot down targets pretty reliably. And so that one sees wide service both, both on new construction and on rebuilds. Talos is the largest and the longest range and arguably the best of them, but it's also the most expensive and takes up the most space. Only a handful of ships are converted or an even a smaller number built uh, to take these new. So, essentially, post-World War II, the U.S. Navy has the largest fleet in the world. At this point, how do you convince Congress to fund new construction when you've got hundreds of destroyers, dozens of battleships, and scores of cruisers? It was very difficult, and while the Navy could build a handful of new ships, they certainly couldn't build enough to replace all of their gun-armed World War II era ships. So if the Navy wanted to add more missiles to the fleet, they had to modernize older ships which you'll remember is exactly what they do in the 1980s with the Iowas. The Navy looks at lots of different options for modernizing ships. These, are, uh, these studies are collectively known as SCB-140 and SCB-146, uh, the, the missile conversion programs. And they look at installing missiles on everything from Cleveland-class light cruisers to the even smaller uh, Juno subclass of Atlanta class cruisers. And then working up from here, the Baltimore and Oregon class heavy cruisers, the Alaska class large cruisers, and the South Dakota and Iowa class battleships. And uh, realistically, it comes down to two choices. The, the Baltimores and the Clevelands are uh, pretty good choices. There's lots of them. And the Iowa classes are really excellent choices. The problem is, you can upgrade two Clevelands for the cost of one Iowa, or three Baltimores for the price of two Iowas. So it's much better to distribute your lethality on more ships. If a ship is damaged, if a ship is down for maintenance, you still have one that's ready to go. And so they chose the smaller, cheaper opportunities that gave them more ships. That retains the Iowas as being all gun shore bombardment platforms, which is good in my opinion. It also makes it easier, because for the Iowas, let's say you're removing the aft uh, gun turret to put in these missiles. You're removing about 2,200 tons of weight, and even though these missile compartments are pretty large, it is not that heavy. So now your ship is all out of trim, and you gotta do a bunch of other work to it. Uh, I'm not a fan of adding missiles like that to Iowa-class battleships. And what I mean by that is removing gun turrets to replace them with missiles. The problem, though, with the choices they made, both the Clevelands and the Baltimores that are modified are very, very cramped ships. There's just not as much room as they need. In the end, there were multiple design studies for each of these programs. SCB-140 was for installing Tartars. So that ends up on uh, a couple of Baltimores, a couple of Clevelands. SCB-146 was installing Harriers which again, ends up on a couple of those cruisers instead of the Iowas. 
Originally, SCB-140 was looking at specifically completing Kentucky as an all-gun battleship. By the time they're looking at SCB-146, later on in the 50s, Kentucky's gone by the wayside, and they're looking at converting the four existing Iowas. The plans looked at both single and double-ended uh, missile ships. What does that mean? A single-ended missile ship has a launcher on one end, either the bow or the stern. Usually the stern with uh, rebuilt ships and the bow for new construction ships. And uh, the double-ended puts missiles on both ends and gets rid of almost all of the gun armament. Some of these designs kept some of the side-mounted 5-inch guns. So in the end, the Navy preferred the single-ended arrangement for their missile ships, keeping guns, which on the rebuilt ships, like I said, meant the guns stay on the bow, the missiles are added on the stern, like on USS Little Rock, where we're filming today at the Buffalo Naval Park. Uh, for the Iowa class, it also looked at removing the, the stern turrets. This retains more of the original surface firepower uh, while adding an equivalent amount of missile firepower. So definitely makes more sense that way. Uh, like I said, new built ships tended to have the missiles at the bow and the guns at the stern of the ship. In addition to installing surface to air missiles on the Iowa class battleships, there was another program uh, that looked at installing either Polaris or Regulus class missiles and turning them into uh, essentially monitors for shore bombardment using missiles in particular, uh, or even as nuclear deterrent vessels. At the end of the day, this is what the Navy chooses to go with. Although not with Regulus and Polaris, it's decades after these original conversion plans when the Tomahawk cruise missile comes around. And at that time, the Navy chooses to do a relatively modest upgrade of the ship, not removing an entire gun turret, not adding this huge deckhouse structure like they had to do with these SCB conversions. Just bolting on missile launchers on the existing superstructure uh, for relatively cheap compared to the price of rebuilding the ship. And that is the way that the Iowas are brought back in the 80s. Interestingly, not a single air defense missile is ever added to an Iowa-class battleship even though using them for carrier air defense was largely how they were used in World War II and one of the things that repeatedly gets looked into over their career. Let me know in the comments section down below, do you think the Navy made the right choice converting just a handful of cruisers into these ships? Or do you think it would have made more sense to keep the Iowa class in service with all of their missiles? And assuming you want the Iowa class brought back, what do you think is better? Carrier? Tartar? Talos? Polaris? Regulus? Let us know in the comments section down below. This Cold War era is often one of the uh, forgotten time periods of the U.S. Navy, where a lot of these World War II ships got to soldier on in second lives. The Iowa-class battleship didn't really get called much during this time period. And it's not until the extreme late Cold War when these ships have been taken out of service, even though plans existed to convert their missile launchers to the more modern styles. So the Iowas eventually get their chance, but when they're already ancient. So let me know your thoughts on this in the comments section down below. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. For today's video, we really appreciate the support of the Buffalo Naval Park and the work they're doing to preserve a really, really unique ship like USS Little Rock here, uh, the last Talos armed ship that's been preserved. If you'd like to support her ongoing restoration efforts, there's links in the description below, both to their donate page and to some of their social media where you can see the ongoing research that they're conducting. Did you know they have their own YouTube channel? You can support Battleship New Jersey by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find about us and our museum. Thanks for watching.